everybody at Gainesville Church. Would you all stand as we sing the words of Jesus this morning? Come on, let's stand up and praise his name. Here we go. See, when all I see, when all I see is a battle, you see a victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Sing, so when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. And nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you are lifted high, Holy, Holy forever. If you've been forgiven, and if you've been Sing the song forever to the Lamb. If you walk in freedom, if you bear His name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing the song forever and amen, and the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing. Is the greatest your name stands above them all above all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all oh jesus your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name above them all, above all thrones and dominions and all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy. bow your heads and pray with me. Lord Jesus, we celebrate you. We praise you. We pray that your name would be just like we said, Lord God, lifted high in this service this morning, high this Sunday as we leave this church, high the rest of this week, the rest of this month, Lord God, that you would be glorified amongst all other things. 
So we love you. We praise you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, church. Well, good morning. Welcome to Gainesville Church, where we strive to encourage a bold and authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. My name is Burt Miller. I'm the youth director here at Gainesville, and it is so wonderful to be worshiping alongside all of you here this morning. Uh, we also want to extend a welcome to those folks that are watching at home through the live stream. Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of worship today. Uh, but we've got a few connection opportunities, things that are coming up within the life of the church that we want to make sure that you are all aware of. And the first thing I want to mention is actually something that happened last night. So if you weren't aware, last night was our big annual mission auction. It's a big auction fundraiser that we use to support some of the incredible missions that we're involved with here at Gainesville, whether those be locally, regionally, or even internationally. Uh, this auction goes to support the, these incredible uh, ministries. Uh, we managed to raise last night forty-three thousand dollars, which is fantastic. You can see some of the pictures. The the theme of the auction last night was the 1970s, so we had a lot of a lot of tie dye going on, a lot of disco balls, some some Saturday Night Fever going on. But it was a really really fun time. Uh, we raised a lot of money for, for some wonderful causes. And for those of you that were here last night or were bidding online, we do really appreciate it. Without you all, the, the auction wouldn't be able to support as many of these incredible ministries that we are involved in. But it was a wonderful, wonderful time. We also want to mention, uh, so we have a new members class that is coming up next Sunday uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. If you've been coming to Gainesville for a little bit and want to learn a little bit more about what membership looks like, what that entails, what it means to be a member here at the church, we recommend you come on out to that next Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, child care will be provided. Uh, you can sign up online on the church website or on your way out the door this morning, you can talk to one of the folks at the front desk and they will uh, take your name and make sure that you are all set for that. Uh, finally, it is that time of year again where a Holy Week is coming up pretty soon, and we want to make sure that you are all aware of our schedule for that week. So we're going to be having a Good Friday service that Friday at 7 p.m., and then Easter Sunday, we will be doing all three of our regular Sunday morning services. So that's 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. And after the 9.30 and 11 o'clock services, we're going to be having our giant Easter egg hunt outside on the lawn. So if you have any young kids that would be interested in the Easter egg hunt, that's going to be after the 930 service and after the 11 o'clock service. We're doing two Easter egg hunts for those kids. Um, if you would like to help out with the Easter egg hunt, we are always uh, happy for folks to be involved with that. Uh, you can talk to one of our Christian education directors. Uh, you can also, if, you, if you'd be interested in doing so, uh, pick up some plastic eggs with candy in them. You, you can put candy in them. We're just asking no peanuts. Um, and you can bring those by the church office to drop those off. We'd be very appreciative we're collecting all of these Easter eggs for the Easter egg hunt, but it's going to be a really, really fun time. Uh, and Easter, it's hard to believe it's just around the corner. Uh, but before we hear the sermon this morning, will you all please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can come together and worship you, Lord. We pray that uh, the message that we hear this morning from Pastor Benson be, be your words, be a message from you. And I pray that when we leave here today, we can take that teaching with us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Bert. Man, $43,000. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, Bert is way too humble. And uh, that's our biggest mission auction ever. Most people attending it ever. And Bert um, sacrifices his health, his marriage, and his well-being generally every year to make it happen. So thank you, Bert. So yeah. As well as a team of people, Pastor Jake and Sharon Hayden, who's like the key volunteer in making that happen. So it's seriously amazing work last night. Before we jump into the message, um, I do want to share a special announcement with you. Our board just recently voted to move forward with a capital campaign this spring. Our church uh, is experiencing an amazing season. In the last two years, our worship attendance has increased by 109%. Our giving has gone up by 25%, and our children's ministry is currently larger than it's ever been. That includes pre-pandemic numbers. Uh, that means we're running out of space, uh, which is a great problem to have because we want more space to reach more people with the awesome news of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we are looking at doing uh, a new capital campaign to expand uh, the building slightly, to expand our children's ministries remodel basically this entire wing of the church as well as hopefully have the funds to do some renovations here to modernize our sanctuary. Uh, all of that we believe uh, we can do uh, 
debt free based on the generosity and feasibility of our congregation so this spring we will be beginning that journey for the next month or so it's a whole bunch of work being done by a whole bunch of people to get us ready for that and so we have put together a campaign leadership team it's more than 40 people in this church who are giving extra time and energy and effort to making this campaign as successful as possible because it's really about planting seeds that will bear fruit and bear a great harvest for our church in the years to come but we are going to start this campaign and throughout this campaign will remind everybody it's not about giving it's not about finances it's about the Spirit of God and how the Spirit of God is moving this church and so we are going to bathe this entire campaign in prayer and so um, just so you are aware if you are in this service obviously and on the campaign leadership team if you would please stand okay it's a lot of people right throughout all of our services we're pumped to have these people on board uh, and so church let's bow our heads we're going to pray for our leadership team and pray for our church and pray for this campaign almighty god we just rejoice we thank you for what you are doing we thank you for the ways your spirit is moving we rejoice um, in the team that you have assembled but we also rejoice in every single person who calls this church community their home we thank you for, Lord, how good you are, the ways that you are moving in our lives, the ways that you are transforming the lives of our people, and we thank you for the opportunity that lies ahead of us. Lord, to make necessary changes, to make our building safer, to make our building more accessible, but also to reach new people, to allow our staff team to continue to grow and to allow worship here to be as good as it can be, to glorify you and help spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we just pray for a continued movement of your spirit in each and every single one of our hearts as we begin this journey together, and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So today, uh, as I said last week, uh, we, are tackling, um, we are tackling one of sort of the big questions that people have uh, about Christianity, about faith, about the goodness of God. And I want to start by reading you this really short scripture. This is Matthew 5, 45. It says, He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, the movement of God is not dictated by our goodness or our badness, our righteousness or our unrighteousness. Right? When something happens in this world, when God brings a blessing or when um, something difficult happens, whatever it might be, right? God does not orchestrate that or control it in such a way that um, it dictates and defines for us who's good and who's not. Right? When it rains, it just rains. Uh, and if it's raining on your house or on your field and not your neighbor's, that's not a sign of anything. Uh, and, and so what this passage tells us, what Jesus is trying to explain to us here, is sometimes in this life, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, but other times, bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. And people have wrestled with that question and that idea for a long time. In fact, the church has wrestled with that question uh, for thousands upon thousands of years. And I share that with you because... Um, there's a really fancy term for it. It's called theodicy. Theodicy is the study or the questioning of is God just? What does it mean that God is just? There are whole books on it. In fact, there's a whole book of scripture about it. It's the book of Job. Uh, you can read it. It's about really bad stuff happening to a really good dude. And people have just wrestled with this question. Now, I'm going to attempt to answer it in 30 minutes. So you should be thinking... You should be thinking, wow, can you answer that question in 30 minutes? The answer is no, I cannot. I'm going to do my best, and I say that so that if I say something or you have questions coming out of today, uh, find me, ask me questions, send me an email. There's no way I'm covering everything in the amount of time that I have this morning. I'm, I'm just going to do my best. So I would say this is a pretty good note-taking sermon. Uh, because hopefully I answer some of these questions because people all the time inside the church, outside the church, right? One of the things you always hear, why do bad things happen to good people? P 
People who don't believe, who aren't followers of Jesus, love that question as an excuse for like, oh, I could never be a, I could never be a Christian. I could never follow Jesus because God's so good. Why do bad things happen to good people? Most Christians, on the other hand, uh, when they're asked that question, they're like, mm, uh, well, mm, uh, I'm telling you, come to church. My pastor's really cool and the band's great, right? <laughs> like, I have no idea. And sometimes as Christians, we go through a bad experience. This is why we're doing this in our whole pain series. We experience pain in our life, and we naturally begin to ask this question that just sort of like exists in the ethos today. But uh, we ourselves can find... Um, can find moments where we say to God, why do you allow bad things, why do bad things happen to good people? And so I just want to give you some answers to that and hopefully start you thinking along those lines. The first, most simplest answer is this, free will. Free will. So, so we believe in free will and we believe that free will is essential to having a relationship with Jesus. Why is that? Because God loves us. God wants us to be in real relationship with God. God does not make us to be robots, to be pre-programmed to love him, but God understands that um, if, if we're to really know God's love and we are to truly choose to follow Jesus, it has to be just that. It has to be a choice on our part. And so God gives each and every single one of us free will. You have choices. You're allowed to make choices in your life. This is what Galatians 5.13 says. You, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh or do worldly, bad, broken, terrible things. Serve one another humbly in love. So God gives us all a freedom. That freedom is the freedom of choice, and we can use that freedom to do good things, and we can use that freedom to do bad things. And it doesn't mean we only do good things and we only do bad things. Sometimes we do a little of both. Most of the time, we mix it up. And so what you see in the world today uh, is that sin and brokenness exist because we as people have free will. In the garden, Adam and Eve, right, they have one rule, don't eat this fruit. And then the serpent comes along and he tempts them, right? He doesn't force them. He doesn't control them, right? He doesn't, like, mind lock them and then they're like forced to do his will or anything like that there's no jedi mind trick happening there right he just tempts them along until they get to a point where by their choice they eat the fruit from the tree and then everything breaks and crumbles after that like why is sin exist in this world it doesn't exist in this world because of god it exists because humans use their free will to do a wrong thing <laughs> How does that interact with our lives still to this day? It, bad things happen to good people because people use free will. And your free will is not just yours alone, right? But your free will also impacts, right, other people, right? I can use my free will to, like, kick Adam in the shin, right? That's something I could do. I should not do it, but I have the free will to do that. Adam's shin then hurts. He is affected by my free will, right? Are we tracking? So here's what happens in life. Uh, I use my free will to get in the car and drive. Somebody else uses their free will to have one to 12 beers and get in the car and drive, right? That is a choice that they are making. It's a bad choice, but it's still free will. That's a choice that they're making. And then because of that choice they've made, let's just say, I'm driving along, following all the rules of the road, doing everything I'm supposed to, and another individual is driving along, and they're drunk, and they're inebriated, and they can't drive, and a car accident happens. And, and let's say I'll lose my life in that car accident. Right? Now, if you assume I'm a good person, why, why does a bad thing happen to a good person? Because somebody else used their free will to make choices, not towards God, but bad choices, that then have a consequence on not just their life, but somebody else's life, right? That's free will interacting that causes bad things to happen to good people, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Because people make bad choices. That's just a general fact. But free will is necessary for that to happen. Now, now sometimes what we tend to think in situations like this is we actually remove free will out of the equation. So, so, uh, 
oh my gosh, my pastor just died in this car accident. This is so tragic. Why wouldn't God stop that from happening? That's the natural next question someone would ask. I don't understand why God wouldn't just stop that from happening. That's actually a statement of believing that um, either there's not free will or, right, the assumption is that God is constantly watching all traffic patterns and either choosing to allow things to happen or prevent things from happening. The problem with that train of thought is it's generally one-sided. So people always say, why didn't God prevent that from happening? But if you believe that God is that finutely at work from preventing things from happening, then you have to accept the inverse of that thought, which is that every time you drive your car and you come to your destination safely, that God has also prevented a bunch of bad things from happening, at which point your safety and your life continuing are purely based on these mysterious movements of God in your life. And if you believe that, then theoretically, every time you got out of your car, no matter where you went, you should fall on your knees immediately and praise God that you are still alive. Now, if your observational skills are anything like mine, most of us aren't doing that, are we? Right? So, so the point is, sometimes when we go down this road, we ask questions and we set up one-sided arguments without thinking about the full scope of what's happening there. Right? Number one reason why bad things happen to good people, God gives us free will. Second thing, hijacking experience. Hijacking experience this is something that when people ask questions like this, when we ask questions like this, we just need, we need to be very careful of. So I'm going to read you a rather lengthy passage out of 2 Corinthians 5. This is Paul writing to the church. He says, are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. And then this is how he describes his life. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Not the most pleasant life. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. One night, or I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. You get where this is going. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. Pause. I love that in the midst of him sharing the hardships of life, of being like literally beaten and flogged and whipped, that he also is like, but guys, the hardest part was when I was without sleep. <laughs> Amen to that, right? Sleep deprivation, it'll get you. Okay, I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever. Why do I read that whole passage? Because Paul basically says, uh, my life is terrible. Look at all the bad things happening in my life. Basically, wherever I go, someone's trying to get me, right? And even when someone's not around me, there's a river. I love that it's a river that threatens him, right? There's a river that's trying to get me, right? I mean, the life he describes, the life he describes, quite frankly, is um, a life that we, that we don't experience. And yet, at the end of that, what does he say of God? Oh, God is worthy to be praised forever. That sounds like somebody who has a lot of really bad things happening to them, saying, I still, I still choose to praise God. My view of God is still a God to be praised. And what happens can happen a lot in, in this question, in this wrestling with, um, in this wrestling with uh, why do bad things happen to good people, is because uh, we look at experiences that aren't our own, and we prescribe our own view on experiences that don't belong to us. So, so we look at somebody else who has gone through tragedy 
and we use their experience to question God or to question faith. The question we have to wrestle with then is what if that person who's gone through the tragedy isn't using their own experience to question God or question their faith? Who are you? Who am I? Who are we to use somebody else's experience and impart our own decisions upon it even though we haven't gone through it? Like there are lots of people, in fact, there's probably more often uh, most people in this church right now who have gone through an incredibly difficult time and yet don't question God because of it. And in fact, most people who have gone through a difficult time actually discover uh, it draws them closer to God. That doesn't mean the thing they went through wasn't difficult. That doesn't mean they're like, woohoo, I'm really glad that tragic event occurred in my life. Like, it's, it's not that you have to celebrate it or be pumped for it. It's just that if you've gone through tragedy or loss or pain or suffering, and yet you still, like Paul, can praise God forever, um, no one is allowed to prescribe their new, their thoughts on your experience if they haven't experienced it yet. So why do bad things happen to good people? That's for the good people they've happened to to share and talk about it, not for strangers to use it as a weapon or an argument for their own. Next thing, though, and this one's fun, and you should think about this throughout the week. What is good, right? Such a simple statement. Why do bad things happen to good people? But no one pauses to actually determine what good is. In, in fact, most of us probably couldn't give a definition of good, like, off the top of our heads. And in fact, I think most people... Uh, they don't actually know what good is, but their definition of good is just not bad. But um, that's not a definition of good, that's just saying something's not bad. We do this weird thing today uh, in, in which we just sort of define good as like basic human being, decent citizenship, and then we just throw the word good in very casually and nonchalantly. Like, I love it when, when you talk about, when you hear people talk about their kids, and I'm, I'm guilty for this now as somebody with kids. But you use a bunch of stuff to describe kids, youth, I don't know, your spouse, whatever it is, friends. You say a bunch of things that have no moral, no moral standing whatsoever, right? So, so you might say, like, oh, great student, well-rounded, participates in some musical activity, and even a Oh, he's on the he's on the varsity basketball team. It's like real good athlete, scholar athlete. That's a great term, scholar athlete, right? Like as if these are things that define any form of goodness. Um, but guess what? You could be a scholar athlete and be a total jerk. You know, uh, there, there's nothing in the way we tend to describe things as actually a statement of goodness or not. I mean, I mean here's like the crazy thing. Like, oh man, that kid's that kid like really volunteers. He's he, he's always serving and doing stuff. It's like, yeah, but what if he's attending a school or part of a club that requires that many service hours a year? Then is it good that he's just simply meeting the requirement? Like, isn't good actually if he had no requirement to do that and was still doing them? Right? No, no one's thought this hard about good, right? I'm with you, right? So, so and then you say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, what's a good person? Right? Who, who, who is determining, how are we determining when the people ask that question, when we ask that question, like, cool, walk me through your good scale. This is what Jesus says about good. Jesus says, Luke 18, 19, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. In other words, Jesus says, hey, guess what? Why do, you don't have to worry about why bad things happen to good people because no one's actually good. It's just bad things happening to not good people. <laughs> and we would all be on board with that, right? Until we realize, like, wait, wait a second, am I in the not good people part? Yes, right? That's what the book of Romans tells us, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Oh, are you sure we've all sinned? Yes, back to point one, free will, Right? So, so it's actually this like very weird like 
uh, attribution of goodness that most of us, like if we were forced to really press in on it, couldn't do. I mean, really, really think about this, right? Like, let, let's say you got to determine that um, there was a level of goodness in which no more bad should happen. Right? Like, where, where would you set that bar? Like, it's, it's hard to answer. Like, you shouldn't come up with a pretty quick answer to that. And you can think about that all week, right? Like, what, what is your perceived bar of goodness that should therefore prevent badness? And on top of that, um, why do you think a level of goodness should prevent badness? Because to do that is actually to eliminate grace, right? It's to eliminate grace out of your life and out of the lives of everybody you know and love and care about, right? I mean, what makes love love, like what makes love so profound is the fact that we have grace and forgiveness in situations. Right? Imagine if you attributed that like, hey, um, you need to hit a level of goodness and then bad things will stop happening to you like if, if you put that into any relationship in, in your life all you'd find out is that no one met your standards right or that sometimes um, someone is good right maybe they're they are good but a bad thing might still happen right like there's there's still consequences for our actions doesn't mean we're no longer good right even though we aren't good it's really hard. And, and so the question in and of itself is sort of has a flawed premise behind it. Now everyone thinks it's a really great question, you know, and that's kind of the point of today is that next time someone comes up to you and goes like, oh yeah, well how come bad things happen to good people? You can either say, here are the answers or here's a YouTube <laughs> sermon from this Sunday, <laughs> right? I will carry your burden for you. But this leads me to this whole point, right? If, if no one's good, and what is good, and, like, do bad things just happen? Um, there's also this really simple response that we have as followers of Jesus, which is, um, it's no secret. This is point four. It's no secret. In fact, uh, we're told more often than not that Scripture, in Scripture, that bad things will happen to us. Everybody just joined the church is like, that wasn't in the new member class, right? <laughs> I'll add it in March 10th. I'll tell you all the bad things that are going to happen. You join the church. It's cool. Okay, uh, but <laughs> in all seriousness, this is 2 Timothy 3.12. It says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I love it, right? Hey, do you want to grow in your faith? Yes. Do you want to follow Jesus? Yes. Do you want the power of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Cool. You're getting persecuted, right? That's awesome. Right? It means your family might persecute you, your friends might persecute you, work might persecute you, right? At some point, you're going to be persecuted. So we have this idea, I just need to be good enough so that bad things stop happening to me. Actually, Jesus, like what scriptures tells us is that no, the more godly you get, the more you will be persecuted. That's a bad thing. How cool is that? I love this faith. It's awesome. Matthew 10, 16, right? Jesus says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. What does God call each and every single one of us? Just like this beautiful, cute, little fluffy sheep, right? And we just run on out there and we're like, oh, are there other sheep to play with? No, it's a pack of hungry, snarling wolves. And we're like, what? What? This is awful. And so God says, don't just be a sheep. Be a sheep with the mind of a snake. What? In other words, what Jesus is saying is he's like, hey, just because you're a sheep among wolves, it doesn't mean get slaughtered, but be smart. Be thoughtful. Be intelligent. Think deeply about things. Right? Realize Right? Don't go out there in this sort of naivete, innocence of like, oh, my life's going to be perfect after all of this. But understand, like, yeah, we live in a broken world, therefore bad things happen. Acts 14, 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true in the faith. This is what they respond. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. I love this. The church starts. The church is exploding. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is going across all the world, all the known world at this point. And like, what do the early church followers understand? We must go through hardship to enter the kingdom of heaven. We still believe that to this day because it's still in our scripture, right? There's hardship in life. It's so much easier to acknowledge the reality that there is hardship in life 
than to pretend like there's some ambiguous level of life and goodness you can live in which all hardship should stop. That, that's just childish, honestly. And then finally, Matthew 5, 11 through 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What's Jesus' response? Man, like bad things are happening to you? You are blessed, right? Too blessed to be stressed, am I right? And Jesus says... Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of things against you. It's not a question of, uh, it's, it's not a question of, are those things going to happen or not? It's that they will happen. It's that they will happen, and we have a response to it. it it's to understand that there's um, a blessing in it. And actually that there is a reason to rejoice and be glad. You say, why is that? This is, this is what's at the crux of all of this. It's not why do bad things happen to good people. It's how do Christians understand the movement of God in the midst of bad things. And there are some phenomenal answers that we have to that. The first is, God works good at a bad. Let me be really clear in the way I say this. It does not mean that God works bad in order to then work good. It just means that out of bad, God is capable and desires to work good. This is like one of, I think, the most powerful responses to the question. Because if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're just stuck with a bad thing happening. If you do believe in Jesus, then you can say, well, this bad thing's happened, and it hurts, and it's painful. But I know that there's something, my good, small, medium, miraculous, that, that my God can do in this situation. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, in the good things, God can work good, but in the bad things... God can work good in your life. It doesn't mean, again, that you like now have to see that hardship not as a hardship. It doesn't mean that tragedy is not a tragedy. It doesn't mean your pain like isn't going to be painful. It just means out of it, God might actually do something amazing. Because the thing is, people tend to respond and love and care more in the midst of pain than, than they do in the midst of normalcy in life. It's amazing, like, when I've gone through difficult seasons, stressful situations, uh, complicated things, loss, grief, all that stuff, people always tend to step up in my life. People will reach out, how can we help, what can we bring you, do you need a meal, does someone need to help Alicia with the kids while you're doing, while you're gone or out of town or, or whatever it is, right? There's, there's always a willingness on the side of humans to give, to love, to contribute, to care in the midst of a bad situation. I'll tell you what's never happened in all my years of ministry. I've never had a great week. I've never been on cloud nine. I've never been just cruising and life is easy and someone from the church calls me and says, hey, Pastor Benson, do you need a free meal? Never happens. It's not going to happen. Don't do it, right? It just shows that, right, like we as people, goodness comes. Goodness can come from God. We feel a need to move in goodness generally more in bad times. God can work good out of the pain. That, that's the beauty of God. It doesn't take away the pain, doesn't change the pain, but good can come from it. The other thing is that God equips us. This is 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. One of the things that happens to us when we go through bad times, when we go through tragic times, when we go through difficult times, we become equipped to love and care and deal for others who then go through it after us. 
I mean, one of the obvious moments in my life uh, is, is when we lost our son. Uh, all of a sudden, I was experiencing grief and loss and pain at an early age in a way that, like, um, just forced me to wrestle with things that, in my naiveness, I didn't think I'd ever have to wrestle with. That situation is still super painful for me. I still cry about it. Like, I still miss him every single day. But a few years ago, uh, I was on the phone with somebody from our church who, like, was much more of just like a peripheral member, wasn't super involved. And they lost, after a long, 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 long marriage, they lost their spouse, and they were really hurting. So I called them, and we talked about grief, and they were like, man, it sounds like you've been through this before. And I was like, I have been through this before. And they are just like, I just didn't expect this type of conversation. And then they joined a small group, and just I get to hear these good stories, but it's like they told their small group, like, it was amazing. Like, he was articulating things I was only feeling that now I have words for. Right? We, we have all gone through difficulty. We've all gone through tragedy. God has used that bad thing that's happened to you to equip you to be there for others when it happens to them. Right? This is how God's goodness works through bad situations. But the final thing is this, and uh, this is actually the most important, simplest answer to the entire question. A very bad thing happened to a very, very good person. That is a fundamental statement to Christianity. A bad thing happened to a very good person. In fact, um, it's not just that a bad thing happened to a very good person. It's actually that a bad thing happened to a perfect person. Have you ever thought about that? When people say, well, why, if God was so good, why would bad things happen to good people? Well, actually, because we needed a really bad thing to happen to a perfect person for us to even have an opportunity to be in right relationship with God. At the core of the Christian faith, at the, at the death, the crucifixion of Jesus, is a bad thing happening to a perfect person. What that means for you and me, actually, because we're not good. We were enemies to God. Christ died for us while we were still enemies to God, Scripture tells us. Is that a very good thing happened to you and me who are bad people? That's what's at the core of what we believe. Right? How, how beautiful is that? When people use that as an argument against God, actually, it's like, that's a pro-God argument. Praise be to God that a bad thing happened to a good person. Because praise be to God that now a good thing has happened to me, a bad person. I rejoice in that. I celebrate that. I'm glad my God doesn't have some criteria of goodness that I have to hit in order for his goodness to then be in my life. Well, I believe about Jesus, what, what Scripture teaches us about Jesus is actually like, no matter how bad you are, God still wants to work good. No matter how bad you are, there is still forgiveness. No matter how bad you are, there is still grace, there is still mercy. And in this spiritual journey in which we're constantly trying to move towards godliness and righteousness, like we will stumble, we will make mistakes, but God looks upon us still as broken people and says, it's okay, I, I still want my goodness in your life. I still want you to know my goodness. You are not a good person. You are a bad person. But I am a good God, and therefore my goodness is freely offered to you each and every single moment of your lives. I praise God that bad things happen to good people because God went to a cross to die for each and every single one of us. And in that bad thing, there is now forgiveness of sin. There is now the gift of of the Holy Spirit, of God's constant presence in our lives. And there's the gift of eternal life and salvation in heaven in which there are no more bad things. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Christ met with his disciples. He tried to explain to them that he was good. He took bread. He gave thanks for it. He broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. He gave thanks over it. 
he raised it. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. Man, he was so good, and he knew the bad thing that was coming. He looked upon his disciples, and he knew each and every single one of them would desert him and abandon him. They were not good people. But he was about to do a very, very good thing. So this morning, as we prepare to come to the table, I pray that you would have a moment of being able to celebrate. To celebrate the goodness of what God has done in your life. The freedom of actually acknowledging that we aren't perfect people, that we aren't even good people. And yet God so deeply loves us. And all we have to do is confess that sin before him. And we receive forgiveness. And so that in this meal together today, that you would experience a new depth and wonder and love of the grace of Jesus Christ and his love for each and every single one of you. If you would bow your heads and pray with me. Almighty God, we rejoice in this time together. We come before you and we acknowledge that we are not always good. We confess to you the sins in our hearts and in our lives, not out of guilt or shame, but out of joy to receive your forgiveness. And we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, for the life he calls us to, for the depth and wonder of his love and his knowledge. And Father, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of the field and the vine, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we would be your body, people striving to be better, striving to live for you more, striving to be more faithful, but people who aren't perfect, and yet you choose by your power to use us to be your hands and feet in this world. We are redeemed by the work of the cross. We are redeemed by your blood. And so equip us and empower us to serve each other, to serve you, to serve this church, but even more importantly, to go out from this place and serve those around us, to serve our neighbors, our good neighbors, our bad neighbors, to serve our coworkers, our good coworkers, our bad coworkers, to serve our family, our friends, to serve complete and total strangers, in this amazing and miraculous way through our good works, they would look upon us and not see us as good, but that they would see you as good, Father. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare to take communion this morning, if those who are serving would come forward at this time, and as always, if you're visiting with us, we want you to know that this is an open table. That means that this table is free for anybody who wants to come forward and receive communion. You do not need to be a member of this church. You don't need to be a member of any church. This is just an opportunity to come and taste and see, as the psalm says, that the Lord is good. If you want a little extra love, a little extra grace of Jesus Christ in your life, you are more than invited to come forward. So we do it in an orderly fashion. Our ushers will lead us in that whole process. When you come forward, you will receive a small piece of bread. We invite you to dip that into the cup lightly, please. Everyone in this church loves to dunk. There's no more forgiveness in that. Light dunks are good, too, okay? That's how I know who sinned this week. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you need a gluten-free option, please let us know. That is available. Jesus Christ said, let the children come to me. And so it's the tradition in this church that our children come forward. Let us all indeed come taste and see that the Lord is good. That's formed. The thief and his plans will pass over. But he sees a red on the door. And I bleed the blood. The enemy can't 
take my family. This home belongs to the Lord. So I'm not afraid to remind him he has no claim in this war. I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. Cause my future is glory to glory. My freedom's been purchased in full For all of the weight of His suffering The Lamb will receive His reward And I plead the blood I plead the blood of Jesus It's more than enough shield and my shelter is my defense and I claim it over and over again and I plead the blood and I plead the blood of Jesus
The lesson I keep on learning, I just need you. I may never know every reason why things are the way they are. Oh, I don't need all the answers. I just need you. Shelter, I need you. Shelter, and hide me away from the harm, away from it all. Safe here in your loving arms, I need your shelter. Whatever the future is holding, whatever tomorrow brings, oh, one thing I know is that I just need you. Shelter. Can we stand and sing this together? Shelter. Hide me away from the harm, away from it all. I'm safe here in your loving arms. And I need your shelter. Oh, and I need your shelter. And hide me away from the harm, away from it all. I'm safe here. Your loving arms, the weight of the world's falling off of my shoulders, not letting go, cause I know that you hold it, you care for me more than I even know, and I just I know that you hold it. You care for me more than I even know. And I just need you. Oh, shelter. And I need your shelter. And hide me away from the harm. Away from me all. Safe here in your loving arms, I need your shelter, and I need your shelter, and hide me away from the harm, away from it all. Safe here in your loving arms, I need your shelter when bad things happen in your life God is there he will work good out of it he will allow you to meet others in their pain because he will ultimately and always reveal his goodness and his mercy to each and every single one of us if you haven't already, please take some time to uh, find the doors outside the sanctuary. Write your pain, what you're going through on there as we as a church continue to use this season of Lent to share in that experience together. We hope you'll find that powerful and moving. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. He is good and he is with you. Amen.